Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, tonight is Monday, December 6, 2021 at 7 p.m. You're at the Dunkirk Town Center Master Plan and Zoning Update Public Meeting Virtual via Zoom. <clears throat> I am Steve Jones, the chair of the Calvert County Planning Commission. Um, I have some other folks to introduce. Before I do that, something that's going to come up tonight, there is going to be some conversation and some some education on land use water resources and septic systems. This information, this is information only, and it's being brought up based on questions and comments that we received from the citizenry in Dunkirk. I bring that up because I don't want anyone to think that it's being brought up because that is a plan. It's, this is only informational purposes only. <clears throat> Joining me tonight is Maria Bueller, Vice Chair, Calvert County Planning Commission. Maria, welcome, thanks for being here. And now I'll introduce the director of the Calvert County Planning and Zoning Department, Ms. Mary Beth Cook. Mary Beth. Thank you, Chairman Jones and Vice Chair Bueller. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us tonight for this informational meeting sponsored by the Planning Commission. As Commissioner said, I am Mary Beth Cook, Director of Planning and Zoning. This meeting is being streamed live on the Calvert County Government website, Facebook, YouTube, Comcast Channel 6 and HD 1070 HD. Staff requests that questions be submitted in advance of tonight meetings. If during the presentation you have a question, for those attending virtually, please enter your question in the chat box. Or if you have phoned in, when the time comes for questions, please use the raise hand function by dialing star nine. Participating county staff are subject matter experts charged with carrying out the operations of county government on behalf of the Board of County Commissioners. Staff do not set policy. We ask that attendees be mindful that staff are here to provide insight into the master plan update and will not engage in political dialogue. Calvert County government staff appreciate your attendance and now I'll turn the meeting over to Paul Conover, the Planning Commission Administrator. Paul. All right. Thank you, Mary. Good evening, everyone. My name is Paul Conover, Planning Commission Administrator with the Department of Planning and Zoning, and I'll be acting as the moderator this evening. I'd like to let you know this meeting is being recorded both in video and audio, so those who are interested but unable to attend tonight may be able to view it. I ask that everybody please mute uh, your phones to ensure that there are no interruptions during the meeting. For everyone attending, please also keep yourself muted to avoid any interruptions. For those of you calling in, you can mute, and if called to speak, unmute yourself by using the buttons on your cell phone or by dialing star six. For those of you on a computer, you can mute, and if called upon to speak, unmute your audio or video by moving your mouse, then using the bo uh, buttons on the, on the toolbar on the bottom left of your screen. You can also mute and unmute yourself by using keyboard shortcuts, and on Windows, that would be Alt-A, and on Macs, that would be, you would press Command, Shift, A. For those attending via Zoom and who have access to the chat feature, if you would like to submit a question, please submit your question in the, chats, in the chat section, either during the presentation or during the question and answer segment of the meeting. If you're calling in and you would like to ask a question, you can raise your and lower your hand by dialing star nine, and you will be called upon in turn during the question and answer segment to ask a question. Finally, if called upon to speak, please say your name every time you speak for the benefit of those who cannot see you. Does anyone have any questions about Zoom or Zoom etiquette before we get started? Hearing none, I will now turn the meeting back over to Ms. Plummer Welder. Jenny? Good evening, everyone. I'd like to start our slides for this evening. So at this point, you should be seeing the, the first slide. Good evening. My name is Jenny Plummer Welker, long range planner with Calvert County Planning and Zoning. For tonight, the planning and zoning staff is uh, joined by uh, several people, which I'll uh, introduce shortly. I will be giving an overview of the update process. And then I'll turn it over to Ruth Davis Rogers, Planner 2, to give uh, uh, results, the highlights from the first, sorry, the second Dunkirk survey, and then also the photo survey. Uh, we'll be joined with by uh, Jessica Gatano, Planner 2, to help us with the question and answer section. Tonight, our four informational uh, segments include those on 
uh, economic development and economic vitality, land use and water resources, and bicycling and walking. After the presentations, as Mr. Conover mentioned, there'll be the opportunity to ask questions on the featured topics and the town center master plan and zoning update itself. Uh, we have received questions in advance of the meeting, so we'll be going through those before we open up and uh, uh, discuss the ones that have been submitted in chat or by phone. Uh, staff will then um, describe the next steps and then turn it over to Chairman, well, we'll do Q&A, then we'll turn it over to Chairman Jones for the final uh, concluding remarks. The meeting is scheduled to conclude by 8.30. Ruth Davis Rogers, as I mentioned, will present the highlights. I will now go talk about our guest speakers. We have Danita Vunchisery, Acting Director of the Calvert County Economic Development Department. Uh, Danita has been um, just recently Acting Director. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Communications and a Master of Science in Business Management from the University of Maryland University College. She is, has more than 20 years experience in the fields of marketing and communication and over 15 years of experience in economic development. Ms. Bunchisery is responsible for managing the county's industrial park and the Patuxent Business Park. Prior to joining the county government, she served as the director of the Small Business Development Center, Southern Region and the Entrepreneur and Leadership Center at the College of Southern Maryland. Our second speaker this evening on our special topics will be Dr. Andrew Lazor. He'll be presenting uh, the first land use and water resources segment, septic systems, how they work and how to care for them. Dr. Lazor is a statewide water quality specialist with the University of Maryland Extension, focusing on private wells, drinking water quality and septic system education. He has been involved in the aquatic science field for over 35 years, having worked in various areas related to water quality. His passion is to help others learn about water quality and increase adoption of practices that are beneficial to the environment and public health. Our next speaker will be Matthew Commerce. He is the Environmental Health Director of the Division of Environmental Health, which is part of the Calvert County Health Department. He will be presenting the second session on land use and water resources. What is the status of the Doug Kirk Town Center's environmental health? Dr. Uh, Mr. Cummers has a bachelor's of science degree from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County in uh, chemistry. And he has 17 years of experience in environmental health in Calvert County. Finally, our fourth speaker will be Tamara Blake Wallace, principal planner with Calvert County Planning and Zoning. Her presentation will be what is Calvert County doing to improve walking and bicycling in the Dunkirk Town Center. Ms. Blake Wallace has worked for the County Planning and Zoning Department for 30 years. In her current position as principal planner, she is responsible for reviewing development plans for multimodal transportation, system effects, infrastructure requirements, and recommendations for the Calvert County Comprehensive Plan, County Transportation Plan, and the seven town center master plan. In addition, other county staff present include staff from the Economic Development Department, Parks and Recreation, Planning and Zoning, and Public Works. Moving on, I'd like to um, note that the county has um, actually nine town centers. We often say seven, but technically it's nine. North Beach and Chesapeake Beach, our two municipalities, have their own planning and zoning authority. So the county has control over the other seven, which include Dunkirk, Owings, Huntingtown, Prince Frederick, St. Leonard, Lesby, and Solomons. Of course, tonight we're focusing in on Dunkirk. Next slide is that the update process, the planning commission in the fall of 2019 approved a three-phase process to update the town center master plans. The first phase is issue identification. This is the phase we are currently in. We've held um, several public meetings starting with our liaison meeting in May, a kickoff meeting in June, and then we did a hybrid workshop both in person and virtual in July. 
with people attending in person at the Dunkirk Volunteer Fire Department. Once phase one is completed, we'll move on to developing the plan where staff will work on um, drafting a plan for the public's review. And then that will be provided with the public's comments and agency comments to the Planning Commission for their review. At which point the Planning Commission will prepare a draft plan for public hearing. After considering those comments, the Planning Commission will prepare a recommended plan for consideration by the Board of County Commissioners for adoption. The Board of County Commissioners will also hold a public hearing on the draft plan and then decide whether to adopt, to remand it back to the Planning Commission for changes, to make changes themselves, or to disapprove it. Why update the master plan? Uh, the master plan was adopted in 1987. There have been very few amendments to it uh, since then. And things have changed um, since 1987, especially economic development trends. Um, even more recently over the, uh, the last uh, year and a half or so with COVID, we've certainly seen uh, trends change. Also emerging issues with transportation. Um, we have the new Ward Farm Recreation and Nature Park to consider how to incorporate that. Um, it's not in the town center, but it's certainly at the edge of the town center. Then the county commissioners adopted the comprehensive plan in 2019 and then adopted the county transportation plan in 2020. This is the future land use map from the adopted 2019 county comprehensive plan. Um, it shows that Dunkirk has uh, an area around it that includes farm and forest area and also rural residential land. I'd like to take a close look, uh, looking at the Dunkirk area. Um, the comprehensive plan uh, the commissioners adopted includes expanding the town center to include the Dunkirk Park and Ride Lot and then uh, Dunkirk District Park. With the, um, without those two additions, currently the town center is comprised of 195 acres. It's a um, much smaller geographic area than the Dunkirk zip code. I would also like to point out, um, while every of our seven town centers is unique, I believe Dunkirk is especially unique in that it's primarily a commercial town center. And using the economic developments um, program CoStar a couple years ago, uh, staff tallied up the commercial square footage for each of the town centers, and Dunkirk had the second highest amount of commercial area at over 800,000 square feet behind Prince Frederick's one million um, um, square feet. I'd like to point out that um, traveling south um, from Maryland 4 from the Anne Arundel County line, the very first property on the east side is the um, parcel with the gas station. C currently, the, di the district park is not in the town center. The first two buildings on the west side are the um, funeral home and the florist. Traveling to the west, the on um, the um, north side of Ferry Landing Road, it is the Smithville United Methodist Church. And on the south side, it's the parcel at the southwest corner of Westward Road and Ferry Landing Road, which is owned by the Dunkirk Volunteer Fire Department. Traveling on the east side, the last parcel is part of the Gateway uh, Shopping Center. And on the south side, it's part of the Apple um, Shops at Apple Green a parcel that is just before the uh, Memorial Gardens. Traveling south on four, the last parcel on the east side is at the intersection of Apple Way and Maryland Four, which is part of the Apple um, Shops at Apple Green parcel. And then across the street, it's the building that's just south of the gas station. So that's a quick tour of the boundaries of the town center. This map shows basically the same thing, but just as the zoning and the Dunkirk District Park and the Park and Ride are outlined in purple. Would like to point out that, um, give recognition to Ruth Davis Rogers for doing a lot of research on Dunkirk's background and history. And with the communications and media relations staff produced two informational videos. These are available from the Dunkirk project page and also posted to our county YouTube site. This is a list of the liaisons. In the spring of 2021, the Department of Planning and Zoning sent invitation letters to civic, 
associations, homeowners associations, and other agencies, inviting them to identify a liaison to work with us on updating the master plan. We met with the liaisons to give them a preview of the update process in May, and we've um, been in contact with, with them, asking them to help promote our public meetings. So if your, um, your group is not on this list, and if your group is interested in being part of that, just contact staff. We'd certainly like to expand the representation. This is the project um, webpage. There's much information available. You can find uh, documents from prior meetings and links to uh, recordings of, of our prior meetings. Also a list of the um, planning commission's meetings where the town centers have been discussed. And a little foot further down on the page, there are links to the, to the various vid, uh, videos. So I encourage you to take a look at the project webpage. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Ruth to continue on and give highlights on the surveys. Ruth? All right, thank you, Jenny. Um, as Jenny mentioned earlier, we've had three surveys. We've had survey one, a photo survey, and survey two. And these three surveys have allowed people to share their thoughts on the Dunkirk Town Center. And all surveys were announced uh, in public meetings and advertised through various forms of social media. And what I'd like to do now is introduce or um, share some of the results with you from survey two. Next. Um, so this survey was not multiple choice. Participants could answer in their own words in sentence form. And question one asked, the Dunkirk Town Center is the gateway to Calvert County. What is your vision for the Dunkirk Town Center in 10 to 20 years? And the top four answers were small town atmosphere with quality services and restaurants, um, little to no change, stay the same. The third one was no traffic problems and that farms would continue to surround the town center. Next. Question two asked, and on this one, there were 145 responses. It asked what transportation, transit, walking and or bicycling challenges do you think should be addressed? And the top four answers were bike and pedestrian paths, traffic, nothing needs to be done, and sidewalks and crosswalks. Next. Question number three asked, and on this one there was 178 responses, what kind of retail stores, business, personal services, and or community facilities would you like within the Dunkirk Town Center? On this one here, the top four answers we had were, um, a second here. We had were restaurants, small specialty stores, big box retailers and change or nothing. They just wanted it to stay the same. Now the next slide is a word cloud. The uh, next slide, please. The next slide is a word cloud of question number three. And what a what a word cloud is is a collection or cluster of words depicted in different sizes. And the larger the word, the most often it was used by participants in their answers. And as you can see here, um, I'm not sure, is, is the um, image still up here? No, Ruth, it is not. Okay. Um, but what you'll see when this comes back up is that the participants um, indicated, whoops, there we go. The participants the indicated that they would like to see, um, well, their number one answer, as you can see, they want to see a target, <laughs> but they also want to see better food and shopping options, um, such as sit down restaurants. Next. Question number four asked, what kind of infrastructure improvements are needed in the Dunkirk Town Center and why? And the number one answer was broadband and fiber optic cable to address those issues. And number two was water and sewer issues. And next, on this one, we also uh, did a word cloud. And with this, you can see that water and broadband issues were frequently mentioned. Next. Question number five asked, what area, geographical or topic, do you think should be focused on in the next workshop? And our very first answer was land use, such as how to manage future growth, the second was roads, traffic, public walkways and paths. And the third was economic vitality, such as improved shopping and dining options and how to achieve those. Next. 
So based on the public's responses to the two surveys and the input that we received from participants at a July 15th meeting, the focus areas for the Dunkirk Town Center were identified as land use, how to manage future growth, roads, traffic, and public walkways, and the economic vitality, like I mentioned before, improved shopping and dining options. Next. We did have a photo survey um, and on this, people could submit what they liked and did not like about the Dunkirk Sound Town Center. One person participated, and I have the slides here next to show. And what they uh, shared was what they did not like about the area. And you can see here what that is. And now, next, I'm going to turn this over to Danita, the acting director for the Calvert County Economic Development Department, and uh, she can be our she can present her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Good evening, everybody. And thanks for joining us here tonight. Full disclosure, I've been a resident of Dunkirk for 23 years, so I too have seen many of the changes that have taken place here over the years. Tonight, I'm gonna to pull the curtain back just a little bit and describe briefly how many companies, not all, but most, make the decision to locate in one jurisdiction over another. In economic development, there are specialized consultants known as site selectors, and these are a unique breed of professionals who are often a little bit commercial realtor, a little bit lawyer, and a little bit financial analyst. They work for clients who send them searching around the world with a list of must-have criteria for a place to build or expand their companies. The site selector's job then is to go through these criteria and create a short list of potential locations that tick the most boxes for their client. Some of you might have remember seeing this process when Amazon went through it recently, or in 2017, 2018, while they were seeking a location for the HQ2 facility, which ended up locating in Northern Virginia. So this first slide here is a chart that was prepared by a member of the Site Selectors Guild. I think this person was British. Um, some of the spelling on here is, is British. Um, but as you can see, there are many steps and decisions the site selector has to go through to arrive at that short list of possible locations. It's only once you get to the second or third phase of this process that people like me would know that a company is even considering Calvert County as a location. More often than not, the screening would take place and we'd have been eliminated without even knowing we were being considered if we don't meet all the criteria that this company is seeking. But once a company does come to us after making the short list, our jobs as economic developers, planners, and engineers in the county is to work with the companies to ensure their plans match our local requirements and timelines, our zoning ordinance, comprehensive master plans, and that we can make the project work for them. We work impartially with any client on any development, large or small, so long as their project is allowed by our ordinances and regulations. I equate it being somewhat like a parcel of land you might own for development of the home. So long as your house plans meet state and county building and zoning codes, the county can't and won't tell you why, what type of house to build. That's your right as a property owner. And we don't tell people what type of business to build or not build. It's the property owner's right. Next slide, please. So while that previous slide showed the process for site selection, this slide shows the top 10 criteria that clients are currently demanding from their site selection consultants in compiling their short lists. As you can see, Calvert County may hit the mark on a few of these and could miss the mark completely on others, depending on the business or industry seeking a new location. You, know, you have a company that, that needs access to a port or a railroad that's gonna knock us out of the running pretty quick. So you can see pretty much the number one criteria that every business is seeking right now is workers, workforce and workforce skills. Now, when it comes to retail specific business locations, this is often done in a slightly different way in that the property owner or management company takes on the role of recruiting specific businesses to fill their shopping center to ensure a mix of tenants to meet the needs of their customers, ensure stability in their center, and either create competitive or complementary services for the community. So for example, in Dunkirk, Rappaport at Dunkirk Gateway, Echo Realty at the shops at Apple Green, and KLMB at Dunkirk Marketplace will work through their lists of potential tenants and recruit the ones they'd like to fill their vacancies. This can be done based on existing relationships they have with franchise managers, by seeking out new partners, 
or through deal-making events that take place during conferences like the International Council of Shopping Centers. Yes, there is an International Council of Shopping Centers, and they are a very aggressive and very popular group of people that get together. Their, their best meeting of all, I'm, I'm told, is in Las Vegas every year. It's, it's quite the event. So that's a quick overview of how businesses make location decisions. And I just want to thank you for allowing me to take a few minutes to explain this because I think there's long been confusion about how these decisions are made and who's responsible. So I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Andrew Lazor of the University of Maryland Extension, who's got some good information for us about septic systems. Thank you and good evening, everyone. Yeah, I'd like to uh, talk with you this evening just provide some basics on septic systems, you know, how they work, and then also how to care for them. And so when those slides come up, and so what I do is I educate uh, primarily homeowners, but I do work with commercial uh, businesses as well on septic systems. And um, you go ahead and you can advance the next uh, slide, next one as well. So I'm gonna touch on again, types of systems and some of the stewardship practices. Next, and just go ahead and, and uh, hit it a couple of times. I've got a couple of points here. It's important, that's good. It's important to note uh, that in Maryland, we have about 420,000 households and businesses that are served by septic systems. So again, 20% of the population in a fair number of businesses, schools, nursing homes, uh, you know, restaurants, uh, mini malls, those types of things are on septic systems. And if they're working properly, they're effective uh, means of treating wastewater, including re reducing nutrients and removing pathogens. And this obviously is critical to basic pu public health uh, because of those pathogens, uh, such as E. coli, which uh, of course is pathogenic to humans. And uh, septic systems can also uh, contribute other harmful contaminants to the groundwater. And these are the er everyday products that we use, uh, whether it's homes or businesses. Uh, hormones, medicines, you know, various types of chemicals, et cetera, some of which are broken down in the soil and, and many that are not, that uh, can reach groundwater. And then it's also important to note that there's differences in the waste strength. Uh, certainly a home wastewater is very different than say a restaurant wastewater, which is what we call higher strength. And then the treatment that's needed for these varied strengths uh, will vary as well. Uh, again, food service businesses uh, have special requirements compared to say a, a retail shop. Um, and then it's also very important to note that system design is site specific. And the reason for that is that the soil is a major component of treatment systems. And I'll talk more about that. Another thing that people often don't realize is that a the drain field portion or the soil dispersal portion of a septic system has a lifespan. Uh, and that's typically about 25 to 30 years. Again, that depends upon the type of system, the type of soil, et cetera. Next, please. And so this is what we call a conventional septic system. It's very basic. Uh, wastewater is uh, coming you know, from the business or the home may go into a grease trap, certainly to trap grease uh, for restaurants. Uh, and then it goes into the septic tank where the solids will settle and the fats, oils, and greases that wasn't captured earlier will, will float. And then it goes out into the soil dispersal area or what's more commonly known as the drain field. So in a conventional system, the bulk of treatment occurs in the soil. A septic tank is primarily for separation and storage volume. There's very little uh, treatment that goes on in, in a typical septic tank. So what you see here is wastewater is being distributed over as much soil as is required by the, the design, and then it infiltrates into the soil and the soil is breaking things down. But the, the important point also is that ultimately that treated wastewater, whatever's left, whatever's untreated, will reach groundwater. Next. You may have heard of a best available technology or, or BAT system. Uh, BAT, Maryland uses BAT uh, terminology. Other states use advanced treatment units or, 
aerobic treatment units. And this is basically, you could look at it almost like a miniature wastewater treatment plant. And what, it, what it's basically doing is, is uh, it has several chambers in here, similar to the first chamber, similar to a, a uh, conventional septic tank, but the second chamber is provides aeration to, to basically provide a, a high quality environment for the bacteria to break down the organics, convert nitrogen, things like that. And so, and then it settles again. And then actually sometimes they're, they're, they're recirculated, but you can see that the effluent here is actually very clear and odorless. If it was a conventional septic tank system, it would be extreme dark coffee, if you will, and it would have an odor. So these systems, which are capable for both houses and businesses, they can be scaled up, uh, do a very good job of breaking down the organics as well as treating the nitrogen, which we're very concerned uh, about here in Maryland with the Chesapeake Bay. Next slide, please. You can see the, um, this slide just shows the 11 approved units in Maryland. And again, these are scalable. Uh, many of these are scalable to uh, you know, different sizes to accommodate uh, businesses. But the efficiency here uh, ranges from about 54% to 77% reduction in nitrogen. Uh, compare that to a conventional septic tank, which is only about six or 7%. So these systems are, are very effective, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Next slide. And then it's also important to note that the technology on on-site wastewater treatment or septic systems is, it, is evolving and, it, and advancing. And so this is just one example of another type of system uh, that is uh, uh, basically uses uh, higher technology to treat the effluent. And this, you know, again, it's called a membrane, membrane bioreactor. And you can see from the bottom picture here that these are uh, basically package units that can be, you know, delivered on site, uh, say for a business to, you know, again, to treat the wastewater. Next slide. And then click once, if you would, please. One more time. Thank you. So again, the importance of soil, it is really paramount in uh, on-site wastewater treatment. And you have to think about the soil as being a natural and chemical filter. And it's loaded with, with uh, these beneficial bacteria that are helping to break down the wastewater. You know, one teaspoon is, you know, could be several hundred million to a billion cells of beneficial bacteria. So Again, the soil does a, a wonderful job. And in a conventional system, as I mentioned, that's where the bulk of the treatment occurs. So if you have an advanced treatment unit, BAT, or, or uh, some of the newer technology and good quality soil, an on-site system, septic system, can, can do a lot in treating wastewater. Next slide. And again, this is just some uh, you know, pictures of different types of drain field technology. Uh, upper left is the typical conventional gravel trench. Down below, we have chambers, uh, which is basically uh, substitutes the gravel. Uh, the, the middle picture is another technology that's used, not so much here in Maryland, but it's, it's basically pre-fabricated uh, artificial media uh, that's easier to install. Um, then gravel provides basically the same function. We have drip dispersal, which is often used uh, in combination with an advanced treatment or BAT unit. Uh, and, and these uh, slowly um, will um, treat, uh, release water rather from the tubing to treat the wastewater in the upper, say, 12 inches of soil, which is where the soil is most bioactive. And so there's some advantages there. And then on the bottom right, we have a, a sand mound, which is a specialized sand and designed, um, has a large footprint and it's also you know, a, an elevated type of footprint. So again, different options and the technologies, as I said earlier, is, is evolving. Next slide, please. And you can click on a couple of these. Uh, so what, are we, what are, happens uh, how do we know we have a, a problem? And certainly the picture right there is uh, surfacing uh, when wastewater is backing up to the surface. So you have in these wet spots, you, certainly the odor, uh, your 
faucets, I mean, see, not through faucets, but your uh, plumbing fixtures, toilets and tubs could be slow draining. Uh, worse yet would be a backup into the house or, or business. Uh, click again. Uh, and then also, if, if you have an advanced treatment unit, there would be an alarm. One more click, please. Uh, and then if they're, you know, um, noticing people getting um, ill because of, you know, contaminated, uh, say, water, whatever the case may be. So again, these, these wet spots are, are very, very hazardous, certainly to public health, uh, you know, pets and children, you know, things like that can take it into the house or whatever the case may be. So this is obviously what we're trying to avoid uh, in our education uh, efforts. Next slide, please. So you can click on uh, a couple of these all the way down to the bottom of the screen would be great. So these are the, what we see as the major causes to uh, a septic system malfunctioning. Um, that's good, I think, right there. Yes, thank you. So um, certainly if the system was not maybe properly designed um, or uh, there's been uh, a change in the waste stream quality, for example, um, where uh, say a business or a home has expanded and uh, again, using um, or having different strengths of wastewater uh, in, improper you know, uh, installation obviously can be an issue. And then obviously soils, there's just some soils that are not as suitable as others. In fact, some soils are not suitable period for a, a septic system because they're so tight, they don't really uh, percolate uh, well. Uh, if it's not maintained, just like anything, anything, uh, any uh, you know, major appliance or technical device, if it's not maintained, it, it's going to uh, cause issues, cost extra money, things like that. Uh, tank being pumped regularly, your filters cleaned and, and maintaining your service contracts is so important. And then the other thing that we see is again, if we have increase in occupancy, that is could exceed the daily designed flow. Uh, again, that soil can only accommodate so much uh, wastewater. And so if you greatly increase the flow rate, you could be overloading it. Uh, roots or, or you know, organic matter uh, clogging the pipes, uh, that certainly can be an issue. Uh, not uh, following you know, proper uh, practices as far as what you flush uh, can certainly cause issues. Uh, and then over time, some of the components of a system can actually settle. Uh, and, and that can make things uneven and, and not work as well. Um, and then typically, particularly for homes, you know, driving on or putting a structure over a drain field is not a good idea. And I know that there's businesses that have um, structure over their drain field. But again, it all really depends upon location and the soil and the depth of the trenches, et cetera. So uh, next slide, please. So these are, these are some basic tips on how to um, basically take care of your, your, your system. Um, you know, and again, we've talked a little bit about these, uh, but conserve water. I mean, if you, again, if you're having leaks or you're using more water, you got to be careful because you could overload the system. Um, certainly for homes, we don't recommend garbage disposals. Uh, if you're draining excess fats and oils, that's obviously a big problem because again, you don't want that going out into the drain field, which then can clog the soil pores. And then that way the wastewater can't percolate into the soil. Uh, maintain your grease traps. Again, uh, businesses often, certain types of businesses typically will have grease traps and they have to be maintained regularly. Um, and then flushing, only flushing toilet paper. Again, we don't want um, different types of materials going into a system. Another real important thing uh, is to channel the stormwater away from your system. And again, this is because you don't want excessive water entering the tank or the drain field because it could be hydraulically overload it. And again, we're trying to prevent roots from getting in there. I think you can click on two more times um, and then follow the, um, one more time, please. Uh, follow the um, regularly scheduled tank pumping. Again, this will vary depending upon the size of the unit, the type of uh, wastewater, and, uh, but it's really important to get 
rid of those solids and, and uh, fat soils and greases because you, again, you don't want that material going out into the drain field. And then again, if you have a contract with a maintenance or septic service provider, maintain that contract. These systems have to be maintained on a regular basis. Next, please. So with that, I'll end, but uh, I just wanna say there's a wealth of information out there uh, on uh, on-site systems, septic systems, um, you know, Maryland Department of Environment, certainly the county here, um, you know, is a great resource. And so at, that, at this, I'd like to then turn it over to Matt Cummers, who is the Environmental Health Director. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Matt Cummers. I'm the Director of Environmental Health for Calvary County Health Department's Division of Environmental Health. And um, I appreciate uh, Dr. Lazor, you know, laying the groundwork here um, for a talk about septic systems. Um, I'm also going to talk about other topics um, next. So the state of environmental health in Dunkirk's town center, um, I really, from my perspective, revolves around three main topics. Next, uh, we're going to talk about water supply. Uh, that was a big topic of uh, in the word cloud that was shown earlier that people were concerned about. So I'd like to really address that. We're going to talk about sewage disposal to some extent, things that are specific uh, to Dunkirk, issues that are specific to Dunkirk. And then we'll touch on food safety as well. Next. So Dr. Lazur laid a fantastic groundwork for uh, septic systems and educating us on, on septic systems, but we'll briefly talk about where our water comes from. Um, in the Dunkirk Town Center and all of Calvert County, we get our water from wells, and these are from uh, aquifers in the ground. This diagram shows a little bit of a, a broad uh, de demonstration of what the aquifers really consist of. Uh, every aquifer has an area of outcrop that is generally um, co generally closer to the fall line, sometimes not always that case. Fall line being the area uh, where we uh, differentiate hard rock from uh, coastal plain sediments. And uh, you can see that's certainly west of the Patuxent. Um, it usually runs right up 95 if, to get a you know decent idea where that where that line is. Um, we're very fortunate in um, Dunkirk and in uh, most of Southern Maryland, specifically Calvert County, to have a, a wide assortment of various aquifers with uh, ample supply of water um, underneath our soils. So um, you know we'll talk a little bit about um, the Aquia Aquifer next, which is an aquifer of importance. Uh, next. So in our town center, we have uh, wells that use both the Aquia Aquifer and, and also the Magathy Aquifer. Um, only, only the larger wells are actually utilizing the, the Magathy Aquifer, and that aquifer is deeper in the ground, somewhere on the uh, order of 500 feet below land surface. Um, and it's uh, generally only used by the larger production wells. There are only, if, you know, probably uh, oh, less than 10 uh, wells in, in the town center that are using Magathy. Most of the other residential wells surrounding and the small business wells surrounding that area use the Aquia Aquifer. One thing I'd like to point out, people have sometimes expressed concerns about the amount of water that we have um, in our aquifers and how long, how sustainable it really is. Um, to, to how, what, you know, what the lifespan of our water supply can really be. Um, this diagram from the U.S. Geological Service kind of points that out. What you're looking at is on the left, the numbers on the left-hand side, uh, the dates ranges go back to like 1981, 82, and you can see that the water level above, um, I mean, below land surface was somewhere at about 135 feet below land surface where the actual water level um, would rise to in a well that, that penetrates the Aquia formation. That doesn't mean that's where the Aquia formation actually is. The Aquia formation is lower, 300 plus feet in the ground. That just means there's so much water pressure 
in that uh, artesian aquifer that it pushes the water up into a well um, at that high. So up to 135 feet back in 82. Um, pretty significant decrease in that water supply and that water level in the acquire formation up until about the mid 2000s. And then we see that level sort of uh, level off of that, you know, those water levels level off a little bit throughout the 2000s. And even right there at the end after 2018, you can actually see the water levels begin to uh, to come up and rise a little bit. So where there's a, you know, most people will attribute that to development and withdrawals, um, you know, from that time period from the 80s through the mid 2000s. And, and now we see that leveling off uh, as development has uh, slowed a bit. Um, not necessarily that much in Dunkirk Town Center, but good news for our uh, formation here that it's held up and actually uh, even uh, rebounded a bit. So um, we have, you know, uh, we're very fortunate to have fantastic groundwater resources. And uh, we should have those resources for a very long time to come. Next. This slide here, this diagram shows, um, it's from Maryland Geological Survey. It shows um, withdrawals. It basically, there are levels of withdrawal in the Aquaia formation. It sort of illustrates where some of the most heavy withdrawals take place, what they call the cones of depression. Um, you can see down in St. Mary's County, probably the most substantial withdrawal comes from uh, Pax River, River uh, Naval Air Station. And then you have uh, another uh, sort of cone that points towards Charles County, where there's substantial amount of withdrawal coming from uh, Charles County, where uh, the Aquaia Formation is being depleted. But up near Dunkirk, you can see we're in pretty good shape. And in fact, um, you know, the outcrop, we're fairly near the outcrop. The gray area above Dunkirk, uh, sort of on the PG County line there, on that gray shaded area is what they call the outcrop. And that's basically the area of recharge. So where water permeates into the soil, that's where our Aquaia aquifer uh, recharges from. Next formation, I mean, next slide. So uh, talk a little bit about sewage disposal. Um, Dr. Lazor's groundwork here of septic, septic systems uh, was really important because basically all of the systems in Dunkirk are private systems, more or less septic systems and or shared facility systems. So all of them rely on uh, a drain field of sorts. And uh, uh, some of them are much larger than others, but uh, we certainly all, you know, all of us, you know, there who use Dunkirk Town Center rely on on-site systems um, for uh, the sewage disposal. That's all uh, primarily commercial development, which um, has its own challenges. Commercial development um, generally leads to a, a higher strength waste. So um, talk a little bit about that. But as Dr. Lazor said, um, restaurants that utilize um, on-site systems, wastewater on-site sewage disposal systems, generally produce the highest strength waste and uh, they are most difficult to deal with um, as you've got grease, battle and greases to remove. Uh, we also have uh, the high strength, you know, actual uh, waste product to deal with and treat. Uh, that, that sort of high strength waste leads to clogging of drain fields. You know, so we find that those systems um, that utilize, that have, that produce high strength waste um, use uh, buildings and commercial buildings, especially produce high strength waste. Those systems that serve those buildings uh, tend to fail sooner than, uh, say, like a residential system would. And um, there have been quite a few failures over the past five to 10 years in the Dunkirk Town Center. We've had to do quite a bit of work um, to replace and uh, do the best we can to replace uh, systems in, in Dunkirk. And we're, what we're finding in that throughout that process is that uh, it's, it's becoming exceedingly difficult to do so. Um, replacement areas that were set aside in some of the older uh, town, uh, shopping centers are really not, um, uh, not really there, not really uh, allowing for complete full-scale uh, replacements in some cases. And uh, so we have severe limitations, basically land limitations. Um, once we've used uh, an area for a drain field, and that drain field um, fails and becomes corrupted. There are um, there are very limited uses for that area for on-site sewage disposal afterwards. So 
an area kind of becomes used up and we have to move to a different area. And um, eventually we run out of area. And so it becomes somewhat problematic uh, when you have limited lot sizes. So uh, this is an important factor here in Dunkirk's town center because uh, there are many sites there and we won't be specific about them, but there are many sites there that, you know, in the future will not have replacement area. Um, and this, this, uh, be, this is going to eventually become a serious um, issue to deal with. It, it has become a serious issue um, in recent five, 10 years past, um, and it will you know, continue to be a little more serious as time goes on. So uh, we talked a little bit about the high strength waste. Maybe if, if you are familiar with Dunkirk, you've seen a few of these uh, replacements take place, and you may have seen some of these replacements that utilize uh, treatment plants or, you know, uh, what Dr. Lerzo was talking about, you know, things similar to BAT or aerobic treatment systems. So a lot of these um, systems that we're having to install now were uh, not previously served by um, treatment, you know, systems. They were not the uh, primary, generally worked with primary septic tank affluent and some of the failures, you know, probably as a result of the, you know, lack of maintenance and uh, lack of treatment uh, over the years. And so uh, we're doing what we can to employ uh, higher strength, higher levels of treatment for uh, the wastewater and the replacements that we're doing now. Um, so it's a good thing. But uh, again, with more food service establishments, um, that's, that's leading to uh, higher strength waste and potentially more problems. Next slide. We'll talk a little bit about food safety here. Um, our office does the uh, uh, food safe food service facility inspections, and we make sure that the food safety in, in Dunkirk uh, is, is top notch. And uh, we really have a, a diverse and ample number of food service facilities in, in this town center, and uh, uh, mostly chain restaurants from what, we, what we've seen here. There's a pretty high level of compliance with, with our food service facilities there. So are in pretty good shape and there's a, there's a pretty high level of knowledge amongst the owners and managers of these different uh, food service establishments. So that's a, that's a really, um, it's, it's great, it's a great thing. You know, in pretty good shape here. Next slide. So looking um, for the future, I wanna talk about uh, the replacement areas and really, really talk about uh, on-site sewage disposal systems or septic systems and how uh, like Andy, uh, Dr. Lazora pointed out earlier, there are a uh, limited amount of areas, um, and every property has a uh, has a basically a, a time frame for how long it will be able to um, serve that building or those uses uh, with on-site sewage disposal. And so, uh, as those replacement areas begin to be used up, um, we run out of space. And time goes on. Eventually, uh, those those properties who no longer have space to accommodate the on-site sewage disposal systems they need um, will likely have to resort to some sort of a pump and haul situation um, for sewage holding tanks, uh, um, unless you know there's becomes an option for uh, community infrastructure. So this is really something to think about because uh, uh, pumping and hauling sewage is uh, very expensive. And um, I know there, you know, some some businesses have already experienced this um, quite a bit over over the years. You know, throughout the process of uh, replacing their failed systems, and uh, you know, it's um, it's it's very detrimental. Uh, again, it hurts the uh, economic um, vitality of the area in that uh, um, you know, be basically uh, additions of flow can't be allowed when we're doing pumping and hauling. Um, economic reasons for the cost of pumping and hauling become, you know, uh, problematic. So uh, it's, it's really something that uh, to, to understand, wrap your head around the fact that uh, with on-site sewage disposal systems, there is a, there is a time frame. There's a limitation when uh, those systems will no longer be able to serve a particular property, specifically commercial property producing high strength waste. So uh, with that, I will move it on to uh, Tamara Blake Wallace to talk about transportation. Thank you, Matt. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm here tonight to talk to you about transportation. 
what is Calvert County doing to improve walking and bicycling in the Dunkirk Town Center and vicinity? Next slide. In 2020, Calvert County adopted its 2040 transportation plan. This plan takes a close look at the need for more transportation alternatives, especially the need for more walkable and bikeable alternatives within our town centers. Walkable and bikeable town centers are desirable places to live, work, shop, and play, and to feel safe while doing so. It reduces the dependency on the automobile and reduces infrastructure investment costs over time. Next slide. In March 2020, the Hogan administration announced a $3.78 million fiscal year 2021 grant to support bicycle safety and access improvements for projects across the state. The grant funds are made possible through the Maryland Department of Transportation's Kim Lamfer Bikeways Network Program. Calvert County applied for this grant for Prince Frederick and Dunkirk Town Centers and received $88,000 uh, $88, grant with county matching funds of $22,000 for a total of $110,000. Next slide. The consultant firm Sovereign Associates, a Mead Hunt company, has been hired to work on this study. The grant project will determine the feasibility of alignments serving important commercial, recreational, and residential destinations in the Dunkirk and Prince Frederick Town Centers. The final deliverable for this project will be a town center pathway plan for Dunkirk and Prince Frederick, which will include discussions of the planning process, alignments investigated, documentation of factors that led to the preferred alignments, and concept plans for each recommended alignment. The consultant has completed their study and have come up with proposed alignments. These alignments will be presented in a public meeting in the near future and will provide the public the opportunity for input on the proposed pathway plan. So stay tuned to the county's website and Facebook page for the upcoming meeting. So this concludes my update on the bikeways plan. At this time, we will take any questions you may have um, on any of the subjects presented tonight. There are some in the chat now that Jenny will address. And just as a reminder, if you're attending virtually, questions can be provided through the chat function. If you are joining this evening by phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand and star six to mute and unmute, and you will be given the opportunity to speak. With that, I will turn it back over to Jenny. Thank you, Tamara. And I'd like to thank each of our uh, presenters tonight for sharing their expertise with us. Uh, we did receive a few questions in advance of the meeting, so I'd like to take those first. And then I'll turn it over to Ruth uh, Davis Rogers for asking the first question uh, that we've received in the uh, chat feature. The first question is, will planning and zoning be using a consultant to assist with the Dunkirk Town Center master plan update? We don't know yet. Uh, there are three consultants that we have on contract, and if uh, we decide we do need assistance, there'll be a competition among the three for um, being uh, for that uh, project. I will note that uh, staff will be meeting with the planning uh, commission in the new year to discuss the public input we've had thus far and, uh, and share the, the uh, highlights from tonight's meeting. And we'll be seeking guidance from the Planning Commission on what the uh, Dunkirk work workshop should be. Uh, we are planning to hold a workshop on um, during this phase one process and then hold a results meeting afterwards. So I would say stay tuned. Uh, we don't know if we'll be using a consultant yet, and it depends on what the topic is. We um, may need to seek assistance from another type of consultant. Another question was, is there any proposed high density as part of the town center master plan update? Uh, the answer is no. Um, there are no plans uh, for, to propose high density residential with this update. Currently, the town center zoning allows for multifamily uh, attached dwellings 
with the condition that they be age restricted and only, or sorry, and no more than 10% of the town center and no more than 14 units per acre. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Ruth to ask the first question in the uh, chat box. Ruth. Thank you, Jenny. Um, could you scroll back to slide number 16? That'd be great. Yes, just a moment. So this first question, um, the, uh, the question was asked on slide 16, the answers are mentions. On slide 16, the answers are mentioned, not necessarily preferences, correct? Specifically, did about 30 respondents say they wanted more of a big box store presence in Dunkirk, or did some of them comment otherwise? And what I'd like to do is show you on slide 16, um, I only covered the first top four answers, but we, we can cover all of them um, because there were people that said they did not want big box retailers. There you go. So if we look here, let me move. I have a little window here I have to move. Okay, so if you look here, we had 178 responses. So our highest response was that people wanted to see more restaurants. There was 36 people that responded to that. 33 said they wanted small specialty stores like hiking, bakeries, um, high quality clothing, things like that. Uh, 30 people said they wanted big box retailers and chains. And that was Target, um, Red Robin restaurants, things like that. Um, then we had 18 that said nothing. They wanted it all to just stay the same. They're happy with it as it is. 16 said they'd like to see a community center. Then 14 said they do not wanna see any big box retailers or chains. We had followed by that, we had nine that said they'd like to see more children's activities. Five said they'd like to see farm-based and locally made type of retail. And I, I could have kept that under small specialty stores, but because that was specific, I felt that that should be mentioned, you know, um, because we are an agricultural community. Um, five people said they would like to see the existing vacancies filled four was other. Some people didn't understand the question. Or the answers didn't make sense. Three, they wanted to see services such as a library, uh, dry cleaners. Two wanted to see entertainment. Two wanted to see medical services. And then one wanted to see a visitor center. And so, yes, they we did not group all the big box retailers into one. We had the big people who wanted to see them and the people who did not. So 30 wanted to see big box retailers and chains, whereas 14 did not want to see big box retailers or chains. I hope that answered the question. So it looks like we just got a follow-up question in um, for your response, Ruth, from um, a Mr. Thompson. Uh, he's just trying to clarify. So 32 do not want big box stores, um, so they want to stay the same or none? Well, 14 specifically said they do not want, these were, we did not do multiple choice answers because I, when we did the survey, we wanted to hear what people thought. And so in the sentences specifically, 14 people said they did not want to see big box retailers or chains. Then 18 people just wrote they did not, they wanted it to see, they wanted things to stay the same. So I guess you could say it was 32, they wanted it to stay the same, but because they specifically said in the sentence, nothing, I want it to stay the same, that's why it was categorized that way. And thank you, Ruth, um, and thank you, Jessica, for the follow-up question. The next question is for Matt Cummers. You say we should have water for a very long time to come. Can you be more specific about the time based upon plan development and growth, please? Well, that's a, it's an excellent question to, to wanna to know precisely how much longer we will have groundwater resources. Unfortunately, no one knows that answer. Um, there is a specific, there's a, I saw there's a follow-up question um, in the chat. I, I will mention this. Um, anyone who they, there are certain projections that people can make, and nobody really understands. One of the things I wanted to show you on that on that one USGS slide, though, is that even with 
you know, substantial withdrawals from the uh, formation. Formations can also rebound and begin to um, and begin to refill and recharge. Um, every aquifer that's a uh, 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 has an outcrop in our, our aquifer systems um, is capable of recharging, and they all have different recharge rates depending on what's happening in the particular area uh, where the outcrop takes place. So. Um, to, to, to put an actual number, a real number, how much longer we'll, we'll have water, uh, it's impossible for me to do. It's impossible for the uh, geologist experts at USGS to even do. Um, but I will say that um, USGS did give a presentation to the Board of County Commissioners, I believe it was September 2019, and they actually um, – you know, they, 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 I actually stole some of their content, you know, from um, that presentation, but it was a, it was a, a really good talk, pretty thorough. And I think the, the slideshow is still on the website. Um, if not, we can get the link, I'm sure, uh, to you. But it's a, it's a good talk to listen to um, or to look at a slideshow if you, if you didn't catch that, because uh, they talk about not just Dunkirk, but the entire county and the different aquifer systems. Um, so, uh, you know, specifically, one thing to, to understand, to point out, I think it's my slide number 43. I don't know if you want to pull that up, but I just focused on the Aquai system because that's what most of our smaller businesses are using. That's the formation that is the most accessible. Um, and it's also the, the one that's, uh, you know, most of our residential and uh, smaller business wells are using in Dunkirk. Um, but uh, there are many other there are several other aquifers even deeper than the Magathy, which is what the uh, the larger production wells are using in the Dunkirk area that, that have not really even been tapped in that particular vicinity. So we have Upper Patapsco and Lower Patapsco and Patuxent. Um, the formations uh, that we – the resources that we haven't even tapped are, 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 still, are there. So if you can kind of see in this schematic um, that I'm just talking about Aquaia. And, and briefly about Magathy as well, but there are vast amounts of water in uh, aquifers even below that. So to, to guess uh, how long the, even those resources would last is, is just so hard to say. So, uh, you know, you can drill a long ways down um, in the Dunkirk area and find an awful lot of water. Matt, this is Jenny. There was the follow-up question about, is the rebound due to sea level rise? Yeah, and I don't believe so. Uh, I don't believe it has. It's there's a direct correlation. If you can kind of see on this schematic, on um, the sorry, the one before, you can kind of see on that schematic. Um, there is a uh, an interface with the Atlantic Ocean, a sort of a saltwater interface that happens deep, deep in those formations, um, and so. It, it, there is some influence on our aquifers from the ocean and from other uh, bodies of water, you know, um, but I do not believe it really has to do with that. Um, I, I think it has to do with uh, the rate of recharge versus the, weight or the rate of withdrawal. So I just think that a, a rate of withdrawal from the aqua, aqua, aqua formation in that area has gone down and that uh, the, the, you know, the aquifer continues to recharge. I don't believe it's a direct correlation, uh, I, but again, that's just my opinion um, that with sea rise, I don't believe there's direct correlation there. Thank you, Matt. Absolutely. I believe Jessica, that you'll take the next question. So the next question we got was, does the restaurant compliance with septic include dealing with grease similar to residential systems? And I assume that's for Matt as well. Well, residential systems uh, deal with grease in a different way than commercial facilities do, specifically restaurants. In restaurants, we have to have um, grease traps or grease interceptors that actually uh, collect an awful lot of, of fat, oil, and grease and uh, and trap them you know we're what we're counting on is phase separation in um, those particular units so we're counting on the fat oil and grease to rise and the water to uh to be at the bottom you know just like pouring water oil in a glass of water so the the you know that's really what we count on for the phase separation and cooling is a is a big deal so we want to uh take that hot wastewater that's coming from like a three compartment sink in a restaurant or even a dishwasher at you know 100 at least 120 degrees and we have to cool that 
um, that down first to in order to facilitate the phase separation. So it's handled completely different in restaurants than it would uh, in a residential setting. Most of the time, uh, there's an awful lot less uh, fat oil and grease to deal with in a residential septic tank um, or even treatment unit than there is with a commercial establishment. So the grease interceptors are much larger for restaurants. Thank you, Matt. At this point, um, does anyone else have any questions? And then if we have anybody on phone, if they'd like to raise their hand. At this time, it doesn't appear anyone is calling on phone. Um, if anybody in attendance would like to ask a question, uh, just shake your mouse and down on the bottom toolbar under reactions is the raise hand function. Jenny, I do not see any hands raised. Uh, Joseph, are you, is that your, would you like to ask a question? You're muted, sir. I'm gonna ask him to unmute. On the bottom left corner where that little microphone is, click on the up arrow. Can you hear click me now? Like, yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I asked uh, my question back at our July uh, virtual meeting at the Dunkirk Volunteer Fire Department, and I, I didn't get a reply because uh, the facilitator, Miss Sunderland, said that she would get back to me, and, and nobody got back to me. So anyway, I'll ask it again because it might be appropriate. Um, this probably would be best directed at um, Mr. Uh, Andrew Lazur, Dr. Andrew Lazur. It has to do with uh, wastewater treatment plants, both private and public. And the question is, uh, that and I like I asked before, is it possible? for the county government, Calvert County government, to get more involved in the, uh, in the, with the active role that oversees and enforces higher standards uh, for the private developers in the design, construction, and maintenance of wastewater treatment facilities. And so this would be including store areas, shopping centers, and if they if if they go with a uh, public uh, facility for wastewater treatment, it would also involve uh, some uh, domestic areas. But anyway, the point being here is I was told, and I think she said it herself, uh, Ms. Sunderland, that the Maryland Department of the Environment is in charge of all that. And I said, well, that's fine, except. At, at our level, uh, we've seen some failures of these systems. Uh, in the case of the shopping center in Dunkirk, the newest shopping center, uh, the failure of the wastewater treatment plant at a rather early date after after, after the stores opened. Um, so that's my concern. I, I, I think a better job can be done in overseeing that by the county than by the state, evidently. Uh, in other words, higher, higher standards and be looking at the design itself, the construction and the maintenance of these facilities so that the county doesn't have to go in and spend taxpayer money to build a new facility. Is that your question, sir? That's it. Okay, thank you. Well, actually, I think Matt would be better equipped to handle that question a uh, local issue uh, my my role is uh, you know education and certainly regulations um, MDE has uh, you know the ultimate authority on on-site systems both residential and 
uh, commercial, uh, and they have very specific guidelines on those systems. Uh, but the local counties are the ones that, you know, are delegated to, you know, look into, you know, specifics. So, Matt, I'm going to pass that off to you. You might be able to touch a little bit more on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I realize there have, you know, it, it, we've talked about this in my slideshow as well, that there have been issues and there are still issues. Um, in Dunkirk. And I'm not going to talk about specific um, facilities or plants. Um, the question, I believe, is could the county adopt higher standards than perhaps the Department of the Environment? I, I believe that's your question. Joseph, you're muted, so just have to unmute again, sir. It, yeah, I mean, if that if that's what I heard, I mean, it certainly is possible, and some counties do um, adopt higher standards. Uh, it, it's that that would be the up to the will of the of the of the county government. So, um, and uh, you know, uh, it can be done. You you know, there can be higher standards for wastewater treatment and for uh, and for wastewater sewage disposal systems. Um, you know, whether it's shared facilities or um, or these uh, you know. Uh, uh, individual systems. So um, certainly higher standards could be done. It, it's it's basically a matter of of, of will and um, whether or not they want to do it. They cannot be lowered standards, though, however. So it's not possible for a county to adopt ordinance that uh, has a lower standard than the state's standard um, uh, for treatment systems and wastewater, on-site wastewater disposal or shared facilities. That's, I, that's, that, that's exactly the point. Uh, Higher standards would, would hopefully contribute to longer durability and efficiency. Uh, that's it, the whole point. Yeah. So it's possible. It certainly is possible for uh, the, the higher standards to be adopted. And again, I know there are some counties that have adopted higher standards for treatment levels. Um, most of the time, they get specific. Uh, to the types of uh, wastewater contaminants that are, you know, discharged, you know, through a particular uh, disposal field. Some, you know, contaminants are discharged to, in land. And in case of Dunkirk Town Center, all of its land applications. So there's no, um, there's no direct discharge into a stream kind of scenarios that take place in Dunkirk Town Center. All of it is land application through a drain field of sorts, some sort of a drain field. Um, some some of the larger systems have utilized drip irrigation systems, and some and most utilize uh, trench systems of some sort. So, uh, okay. yeah, okay. just had I'm just curious, would that be the same for a public uh, system um, that would in, also be be used for domestic, you know, the homes uh, or uh, townhouses? Would that be the same? In other words, stick with the septic system idea yeah for, as it, for large scale yeah as it stands right now um in dunkirk there really wouldn't even be an option um for anything but like an on-site system or a shared facility so there really isn't any community sewer option you know okay, okay. thank you is there anybody else who would like to ask a question please use the raise hand function Paul, well, Joseph did he put his finger up? Paul, Steve Jones here. Just a quick comment, Matt. If I could ask a question, and and Joe, this goes and thanks for your question. Um, it goes to what you said. If in fact the county was to raise the standards, the health department would still have oversight over that property at the end of the day. Just just so we're clear, the county wouldn't could not take, I guess, have um, oversight as far as whether they're going to pass or fail a septic system is what I'm saying. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So, right, that's that's correct. And the health department would still have to make sure that the, the state's minimum requirements were, you know, uh, satisfied as far as a regulatory, uh, from a regulatory perspective. But if the county did impose um, a, a higher standard, um, and that's something that could be uh, enforced either by, uh, you know, the, the local health department or even by, you know, um, a branch of the county government. Thank you, Matt. And Joe, thank you, sir. Anybody else like to ask a question, make a comment? 
this is Jenny. Um, we do have a, another question in the chat box. I believe, Ruth, if you could do the one about development plans. Um, well, I think, we, did we miss the one? Does the restaurant compliance with septic include dealing with grease similar to residential systems? I believe that one was covered. That, okay, so we fully covered that. Um, are there any development plans for Dunkirk Town Center in the conceptual stage? I don't see how the town center can support any more growth given the water treatment issues. And who would be, uh, Jenny, you might be the best person to answer that. Actually, I think the best person would be Paul Conover, the Planning Commission Administrator, since he deals with site plans and subdivisions. Paul? Thank you. Can you repeat the question? Sorry, there, I was monitoring something else. I that's okay. <laughs> Are there any development plans for the Dunkirk Town Center in the conceptual stage? I don't see how the Town Center can support any more growth given the water treatment issues. And none that I'm aware of at this time. We do have one hand raised, Jenny, if it's okay to go back to the attendees. Okay, Charlene, are you, if you can unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to know how I can get a hold of the transcript, transcript for this meeting. Uh, we've looked into that and we've sent some information on to uh, Jenny and her staff to work on that. I'm not sure where it's going to go uh, as far as being able to get it done, but we've also talked with our uh, CMR staff to see what we can do to get that to get as much of that done for you as possible as soon as possible. Okay, greatly appreciated. Thank you. This is Jenny. I will note that this is being recorded, so anyone can go back and watch the video. Also, there's a live transcript that's happening as we speak, and we'll see about how that can be uh, downloaded um, for your use. So thank you, yeah, Mrs. Kramer. Uh, oh, oh, I couldn't figure out how to get to the transcript, so that's okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any other, uh, any other questions, Charlene? There's hands still up. No, I'm good. Um, okay. It's been very informative. Um, we'll just have to see where you go from here. Thank you, ma'am. Jenny, back over to you. Thank you. Um, I note that it's 8.22. This was the um, last call for any questions. And then we've got a few slides to wrap up for this evening. I do see that um, Jim Markham has sent a message into the chat box that it's not a question, but a comment. I appreciate the detailed schematics provided and the subject matter experts um, present this evening to explain how the impacts of the future impacts the future of the town center. So special thanks to our four featured speakers, um, Danita, Dr. Lazor, Matt Commerce, and Tamara Blake Wallace. Do we have any more questions from anyone before we head down the path? We're close to wrapping up, but I want to make sure that everyone had a chance to be heard. Um, and I will give it a few seconds. Jenny, I hope I didn't just cut you off. No, sir, you did not. Um, if, why don't we go to the um, few slides that Ruth has to wrap up, and then we'll turn it over to you. And if there's any last question, we'll then uh, take it there. But I believe we have about three slides left. So if I uh, could, I'll share the screen and then Ruth will uh, take us on out and then turn it over to you for any last questions. At this point, next steps, Ruth. Yes, thank you. Uh, so as Jenny mentioned earlier, our next steps will be that um, we'll have a meeting. We'll, we'll, our next meeting will be a workshop. This will be based on the discussion from this meeting um, what we do with each meeting and survey is we build upon it for the next one. Uh, so again, we'll review everything that happened during this meeting so that we'll know how to plan our next workshop. This meeting will be held uh, later this winter. Next. 
And of course, to learn about events, you can always go to our website, www.Calvert County, Maryland, Dunkirk Town Center. Um, you can also sign up to receive email messages. Um, on this, when you go to our website, you can click on Notify Me under the news flash and select Planning and Zoning. And then whenever we have meetings or, uh, or any type of activities happening in the planning department, you will get automatic emails. You can also follow us on Facebook. Next. Um, let's see, and for information on Calvert County government, you can go to um, online at www.calvertcountymd.gov. And you can stay up to date with Calvert County government on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash calvertcountymd.gov. Next. And thank you. Um, any questions and comments that you may think of after this, you can certainly email us at towncenterupdate at calvertcountymd.gov, or you can call us at 410-535-1600, extension 2356, during our business hours of 8.30 to 4.30 p.m. Thank you, Ruth. I'll turn it back over to Chairman Jones. Well, um, everybody, thank you so much. Um, and I'll, I'll just for, just to make sure that I did it, any other questions? This is Jenny. I do see one in the uh, chat box. Can these meetings be included in the calendar in uh, Bay News? Our communications and media relations staff put out press releases to the press. So it depends on whether they include it, but um, be, be, please be assured that we do provide this information to the, uh, the news media outlets. Uh, you can always check our county um, project page for upcoming meetings. Uh, and if, as Ruth mentioned, please sign up for the news flashes. We do uh, give notice as soon as we have a scheduled meeting so that um, people can get it on their personal calendar. So thank you very much, Mr. Jones. Thank you, Jenny. So I want to thank all of our, our staff and all of our guest speakers. Thank you very much. A fantastic job tonight. And a special thanks to everyone uh, on this call, especially those of you that participated and asked questions. Uh, we really appreciate that. And just a little bit of background. I, I don't want to call this gentleman out, but Mr. Marrow submitted a few questions. Jenny and I spoke about it, and we had a chance to address it. And, and what I'll say to you is, is that there potentially could be follow-up questions of that. Mr. Marrow might, may have some questions you know, moving forward about getting maybe a little more detailed information, which we'll certainly provide. So Tom, thank you for that. And thank all of you for participating in the chat box. Listen, we work for you, okay? We're, we're public servants, all of us, and we're here uh, to answer your questions and to get a job done and, and make sure that we're providing for Calvert County the best way that we can. So thank you all very much. Um, Next week, Jenny, I believe we our next meeting is on the 15th. Uh, we have a planning commission meeting at 7, Paul, is that right? That's uh, correct, sir. 7 p.m. Uh, next Wednesday. Uh, try to join us if you can. If you can't, I will tell you, I think that's our last meeting of the year, so I will tell you a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to all of you. And God bless, and thank you all for attending. And that concludes our meeting tonight. Thank you very much. <clears throat>